There is a little-known character in the Bible by the name of Melchizedek. And if, in your reading, you've ever come across him and wondered who he is and what he's all about, we're going to cover where he appears in the Bible today and what his significance is for our understanding of Christ. And so thanks for joining with us today as we learn more about this figure, this Melchizedek. Melchizedek appears in only a few pieces in the Bible, in Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapters 5 through 7. And his presence in all is comparatively brief. Melchizedek's whole story is included in Genesis 14, and he appears briefly and rather unexpectedly in this narrative. Here, Abram has moved to the promised land, and after he arrives, there is a battle that takes place between a couple of sets of kings. During this battle, his nephew Lot is taken prisoner, and Abram, notified of this, goes in pursuit. He rallies his men, and they go and at night surprise the king who has taken them prisoner and uh, is able to drive them off and recover Lot, uh, his people, and all the property that was taken here in this battle. Abram returns home, and he is greeted by a couple kings. Uh, the king of Sodom, who was uh, one of the kings that was defeated in this battle and in whose land Lot was living, and also by the king of Salem, Melchizedek. The whole of the story is here in Genesis 14, beginning at verse 17. After Abram's return from the defeat of Shedder Loomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And that's it. That's the whole of the story of Melchizedek's life uh, included in the Bible. It might surprise many at how brief it actually is but there are some important facts that come through that are important later on in the Bible. Firstly, Melchizedek is described here as a priest of the Most High God, or God Most High. This is the same God of Abram, and indeed, uh, Abram echoes this phrase, God Most High, here in the verses that follow. He is both a priest and a king. He is king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, and he is also a priest. He is, moreover, a priest without genealogy. Unlike most figures in the book of Genesis, uh, Melchizedek appears on the scene without any reference to his genealogy. Genealogy is very important in this book and throughout the Old Testament. And it's notable, if not striking, that Melchizedek uh, appears without any reference to his lineage, whom he comes from, or regarding how long he lived and when he died. Melchizedek, moreover, brings out bread and wine to greet Abram, he blesses Abram after his victory, and Abram tithes him. That is, he gives Melchizedek a tenth of his possessions. And importantly, Melchizedek has a significant name and title. His name is Melchizedek, which means uh, technically Melchizedek, or King of Righteousness. Moreover, he is King of Salem. Salem, Shalom, is peace. And so he is both King of Righteousness by name and king of peace by position. This also will be important later, as we'll find out. The second reference in the Old Testament is also very brief. It comes up in Psalm 110, where the psalmist here, David, writes, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. This Psalm 110 is notable in being the most quoted chapter of the Old Testament by the New Testament. It's regarded as a prophetic coronation psalm referring to the Messiah. And in this, it acclaims the Messiah as being both a king, a victorious and mighty king, and here in this verse, also a priest. It includes, importantly, that this priest is established by God's command, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, it is made directly by God. This is also sealed with an oath. It says the Lord has sworn. This one who is made a priest is a priest after the order or type or form of Melchizedek, whom we encountered in Genesis 14. And lastly, this priest is to be a priest forever, eternally, after this order. 
So here in the Old Testament, we have two references. We have the story of Melchizedek in Genesis 14, and then a prophetic expectation detailed here in Psalm 110, pointing to a future uh, king priest, uh, which the New Testament takes as the Messiah. These are the two Old Testament sources we have for Melchizedek. However, Melchizedek also appears in other literature of the time. Many Jewish commentaries regard Melchizedek as Shem, the son of Noah, and is simply existing by this other name, Melchizedek. Philo of Alexandria regards Melchizedek as an allegorical figure representing reason, or the logos, that as a righteous and peaceful king governs a person favorably. And there are a few remaining apocryphal references to Melchizedek as well. He turns up in the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, where he is regarded as the Holy One, the High Priest. He is a true image of the true High Priest of God Most High. And he comes and makes war over his spiritual enemies and prevails. Melchizedek appears also in the apocryphal birth of Melchizedek, connected to Second Enoch, where he is uh, born by miraculous means, emerges uh, as a fully formed adult with priestly garments from his birth, and God, appointing him to be his most high priest, saves him from the flood by sending him off to the paradise of Edom through the work of the archangel Gabriel, and uh, keeps him safe until the waters of the flood subside. And most dramatically, Melchizedek appears among the Dead Sea Scroll documents. A scrap in cave 11 bears his name, 11Q Melchizedek. And in this document, Melchizedek is an apocryphal figure that initiates by proclamation the year of Jubilee. He delivers captives from the kingdom of Belial. He establishes a righteous kingdom. He allies himself with heavenly beings. He judges God's holy ones. And he even atones for the sons of light. In this regard, Melchizedek is almost a messianic figure, as described in these Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you'd like to find out more about these documents, we just did a series about them, and the links are in the description below. As seen in these documents, a good number of legends of fantastic stories developed around this figure of Melchizedek, as he appears relatively briefly, mysteriously, and is given little definition by the Old Testament scriptures. For these same reasons, Melchizedek appears in esoteric modern texts as well. Melchizedek appears with some frequency in New Age literature, with expanded reflection on this order of Melchizedek, uh, positioning him in a variety of ways, but oftentimes as a, a divine celestial being or even as coming from another world. And the Melchizedek priesthood also plays an important role in the Mormon church, where it is a central concept in LDS spirituality and in church governance. Because of Melchizedek's lack of definition in the Old Testament, his story lends itself to speculation and imagination, and for this reason we find him as presented in a wide variety of ways in spiritual texts both ancient and modern. The importance and purpose of Melchizedek's appearances in the Old Testament, however, come into focus in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Here, Melchizedek is named more than anywhere else in the Bible, mentioned eight times, and the chief reflection on his person and function is in the seventh chapter here in the book of Hebrews. He helps answer our questions about Jesus' atonement, his sacrifice on our behalf, how he, as the tribe of Judah and not of Levi, could firstly be a priest, and secondly, offer a sacrifice of any significance. This treatment in Hebrews 7 helps us to more fully understand the atonement, how our sins are forgiven by what Christ has done for us. Without going through line by line the whole text of Hebrews 7, which I encourage you to check out yourself, the author of this letter makes these points. Melchizedek is by name king of righteousness and by title king of peace. Christ, of course, is hailed as king and is named in Isaiah 9 as Prince of Peace. Elsewhere in the scriptures, righteousness and peace go side by side. Melchizedek has no genealogy, no father, mother, beginning or end, and he is thereby a priest forever. 
as mentioned, he is an eternal priest. As Psalm 10 states, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. While Jesus is of the tribe of Judah, Jesus is made a priest not by genealogy, but by his eternal life. This is important, as Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, descended from the family of David, and there is no mention in the Mosaic law of priests coming through the tribe of Judah. Instead, the priests were all to come from the tribe of Levi through the family of Aaron. There is this one exception, however, found in Genesis 14, of the priest of Melchizedek, established not by genealogy, but established apart. This separate priesthood is also greater than the priesthood of Levi. Hebrews 7 notes how Melchizedek blessed Abram, the greater blessing the lesser, and Abram gave him a tithe, that is a tenth of his possessions. And likewise, the tribe of Levi through Abram here tithe to Melchizedek and are blessed by him. In these ways, the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of Levi. The Levitical priests were many because they died and were replaced. However, this priest of Melchizedek is one as he exists forever. With this change of priesthood from the Levitical to the order of Melchizedek, the author also notes that there is a change of law associated with it. For the law governed the Levitical priesthood, and the Levitical priests lived, taught, and upheld this Mosaic law. However, this priest of the order of Melchizedek exists apart from this priesthood and the law that establishes it. And so with this change, there is a change of the law as well. And very importantly, unlike the Levitical priests that had to offer sacrifices for their own sins, this one priest is holy, blameless, unstained by the world. And not needing to offer a sacrifice for his own sins and those of the people daily, he is able to offer a perfect sacrifice once and for all. Hebrews 7 describes how Jesus is the fulfillment of this priesthood of Melchizedek. And it explains how he, though not being of a family of priests, is able to serve in the position as a high priest and as king, and is able to offer a perfect complete, single sacrifice for the sins of all. And this existence of Melchizedek in Genesis, this prophetic expectation of Psalm 110, are both necessary for completing our understanding of how Jesus could serve as this priest and how his sacrifice could be wholly effective. So while there is much speculation and imagination around this person of Melchizedek, he, as a real person connected with real promises, serves a very real and important role in completing our understanding of who Christ is and what he came to do. So thank you for joining with us in this reflection on this mysterious figure from the Bible. And may God bless you today.